All righty, here we go. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Joey Katz. I am the program associate with Boston Jewish Film. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in for tonight's live Q&A with most of our Fresh Flicks uh, filmmakers. So we're just going to go around here because we've got a lot of people here. Um, we have Charles Wall, the director of The Moyle. We have Mark Rosenblatt, the writing, writer and director of Ghanif. We have Anika Benkov, writer and director of Binding of Itzik. And we have Uriah Hertz, director of Devik. And finally, uh, we have Asaf Saban, director of Paradise. Thank you all for joining us today. All right. So um, we are just going to hop right into this right now. Um, so yeah, I wanted to make sure that everyone gets a chance to answer questions tonight. Um, there are some really interesting common threads through um, throughout your uh, short films, which is, was not intentional, but is, is always nice to see. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about all of your films individually and then collectively is that they're, they all are so personal um, and they really feel like they all come from personal experience in one way or another, um, whether implicitly or explicitly. So I guess the first question is, um, are your films inspired by personal experience? And if so, what part of your personal experience, if you don't mind answering? And this is open to everyone. Can, can we start with uh, Charles? I'm gonna, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot sure, here. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, yeah I, I, so um, my film's about a, a young couple who uh, live in a community uh, that doesn't have a big Jewish community, right? And, um, you know, they have their first son and they need to, you know, have, have a bris. So they need to fly in a moil. I, I mean, I am a dad. I am Jewish. I've had two boys. So I've, I've definitely I've been through the, the Brit Mila process uh, a couple times as a dad. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So definitely, um, you know, there's inspiration that came from, from going through it um, and going through the process of having to like fly one in and, and, and go through the whole process in a place where there isn't really a big Jewish community and, uh, all the things around that. I mean, what happened in the film, it, it is fiction, but it's definitely pulled from, from experiences I've had, but also experiences I've heard from, from other people as well um, over the years with regards to just Jewish ceremony and conversion as well in general. Interesting. Whoever wants to go next. <laughs> um, I can say, yeah, so my film is about a middle-aged Hasidic bookbinder who stumbles into a BDSM relationship through a, a misplaced bondage ad on Craigslist. Um, and obviously I'm not a middle-aged Hasidic bookbinder, hopefully that's obvious, but, um, and I'm actually a, a secular Jew, um, but I wrote, I was kind of inspired um, by my own experience of um, exploring kinks on the internet while in this process of coming out as non-binary which is very messy and strange and and the anonymity of the internet makes it stranger um and i wrote it for my roommate lily rosen who is ex-hasidic and um at the time was not out yet and um so she i, I thought she would be the perfect actress for this uh, to play this book binder and then later it turned out to be um, a little more personal. Well, we, I also kind of, um, I, I adapted the role for her based on conversations we had in our living room about our experiences talking to strangers on the internet. And she told me about, you know, growing up like AOL chat rooms when it was like brand new um, as kind of like an escape as a teenager and um, playing the long distance girlfriend of, um, of strangers on the internet. Um, so I, I thought that this would be the perfect part for her. And then later after we started screening a film, she came out as trans and it kind of took on a whole new personal meaning. So it's a very personal film and has a lot of kind of weird, unexpected connections to the different people who were in it. Um, that I really like about it. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, Mark, I know 
just a little bit. I know that you that your film Ghanif does take some inspiration from your family history. So how much of that was was incorporated into Ghanif? Yeah, um, so my film explores, basically explores inherited trauma from the Holocaust. <clears throat> uh, and I come from my, I, mean, I guess like a lot of people who may be watching, you know, have some connection, family connection. My, my maternal side survived and um, my grandmother grew up with a lot of stories around the Friday night table, listening to my grandmother's stories of being hidden throughout the war in around occupied Europe and also was aware growing up of not just the people that survived that I knew but that there were scores of people that were murdered and so there was this strange sort of like like I think something I was always aware of as a kid was you know seeing occasionally seeing a, a, a concentration camp tattoo you know as someone was pouring tea in, a, in our front room or knowing that there were people still processing paranoias and insecurities and fright and, and vulnerabilities that they were carrying through from that, that, that hellish time. Um, and like I, the story of the film, which is essentially a film about a little girl in the 1960s who in London, who um, hears a story from her mother about hiding possessions from strangers um, because in the war you don't you didn't show people what you had because they might steal from you um she then projects that onto her the innocent family cleaner and 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 their friendship starts to deteriorate across the film so it's sort of about you know um how children sort of internalize what their parents have brought brought with them and brought brought to them so it's just like that incident that never happens but um it, uh, a fragment of it is true. My grandmother probably did do sort of hide things um, out of paranoia and insecurity. Um, the, the, the film then kind of is a sort of, in a way, a, a sort of thought exercise about what would happen if you push that to an extreme. Um, but yeah, it's very, very much drawn from um, what I absorbed growing up uh, in the 80s and 90s in, in London. Um, Asaf or Yuria, you wanna, who wants to go next if you have <laughs> an answer? Um, I see Uriah is uh, muted, so I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually, in a way, it's the least, I wouldn't say personal uh, film of mine, but not based on my own. I would say it took me a while to kind of, um, um, describe or find out why um, I want to make this film. It wasn't very obvious for me, but in a way I'm not, uh, I'm trying to, uh, my first and very important test is, well, has much to do with intuitions. And the fact that this idea came to my mind was in a way good enough reason to kind of uh, continue with the idea. Um, the story of Paradise actually tells, uh, well, it tells the story of, of uh, Ali, a Palestinian uh, guy, who's kind of um, get uh, in a bit of identity um, um, trouble, let's call it, in, in Sinai, when he's uh, coming um, to Israel after a long, um, well, absence, he's uh, coming for a, a home visit, and well, he's kind of having this detour, um, running away in a way to a um, few days of supposedly peace and quiet in Sinai because before he needs to face, um, you know, the, let's say the reality is kind of uh, uh, ran away from. And it, in a way it kind of, well, I found myself in, in Sinai on my own and I wasn't in a very communicating mood, let's call it that way. And I had a book with me and it was in English. And uh, there was a group of Israelis on the same beach where I was. And before, because I wasn't really socializing that much, they were uh, sure I'm not uh, one of them. They, they approached me in English. And I'm not an actor and I wasn't really into uh, trying to fool anyone, but uh, in a way I kind of um, 
gave out the the fact that I'm I speak Hebrew and I wasn't really trying to uh, follow that uh, misunderstanding, let's say. And but you know, it, for some reason, that idea, that basic idea for the story, came to my mind, and it was done as part of um, kind of. Um, um, a program or uh, you know it was a call for submissions and I just submitted a very very basic idea that I had and for me it was very obvious that if this idea would kind of develop and I would get a green light to further develop that project the first step I would do is to bring in a co-writer a Palestinian uh, filmmaker who would bring some of let's say his own personal experiences life experiences into the the story it wasn't just um, for practical reason it was mostly for an ethical reason uh, for me because i have let's say an issue about uh, speaking on behalf of others let's call let's call it that way or the other because i if i want to it's not up up to me to, you know, I just need to acknowledge the fact that I'm part of this uh, game in a way that I am uh, taking a side regardless of what my own personal opinions are. So uh, be, uh, for me, it was very obvious that I would need someone um, that the character of Ali is closer to his own life experience and identity in order to just make this, um, you know, film. And luckily, I came to know uh, someone who's very uh, quickly became a good friend of mine. His name is Naif Hamoud, and he's a Palestinian filmmaker. And we uh, wrote the script together, and he brought a lot of his own uh, life experience and identity issues into the into the character. So, yeah. Wow. Um, and finally, uh, Uria, if you could speak to your experiences. Yeah. Um, so my film, Devek, uh, tells the story of uh, Elia, a young man who takes his uh, sick mother, Nomi, to uh, visit a psychic medium in order to get some strength because of the mother's uh, dealing with uh, her disease and kind of, um, I don't know, growing up a film, it tells uh, it. It's, it's from the boy's perspective and it's not exactly like it, it based on, on personal elements from my life that I took from some different parts. It's mostly it's about, yeah, it's inspired by um, the relationship I have with my mother. I really connected to her and um, of me dealing with the fact that a um, few few years ago we discovered that she have some um, medical issues and i started asking myself the simple question of losing someone you love and that in, influenced you and is like one of the most um, important uh, person in your life and yeah and then i just thought about the idea it's also based in some point about an experience that I shared with her we went to a psychic medium but uh, for another issue and then I just mixed all these elements that I have in my memory and this is how the film uh, was born oh, fantastic thank you all very insightful I'm like can't wait to go back and watch these all again with all of this context I love that um one of the things also I found that was really interesting is how most of your, all of these films really kind of share an element of characters feeling isolated, um, either isolated in their worlds or personally, where to the point where they have to kind of pretend to be someone they're not. Um, so I was just, uh, I guess my question is um, how, how important was that whether just as a film or as a Jewish film or a film that tackles Jewish issues or just identity issues, how important was it to kind of make sure to kind of stress the isolation that your characters felt um, or these kind of identity crises? Um, I guess, uh, Anika, you wanna go first on that one? Sure, yeah, that's a big theme in binding 
Um, and I say this again, I'm not ex Hasidic, I'm a secular Jew, but I think one thing I've learned from living in um, a Yiddish house with um, ex -Hasid Hasidic actors for a few years has been kind of this, um, this theme of like, uh, everything is very structured and everything has a place. Um, and I was really fascinated how um, particularly older unmarried people from my roommates descriptions um, could, could really fail to fit into their place or really feel like they didn't have a place. Um, and to me, that's not so much a curiosity as an outsider as it is, it feels like an amplification of things that exist for non-Hasidic, for us in mainstream life too. Um, this kind of pressure to be with someone or to, to have a stable, you know, simple seeming identity um, and the way that people kind of hide in relationships as a way to define themselves or feel secure. Um, and the way that being alone or being being different or being hard to to fit with with a person romantically could kind of make you feel exposed or, um, you know, it doesn't have to be romantically, I think, also feeling like you don't fit in with your family or feeling like you just you don't really have a clear place. So I'm, I'm fascinated of both. You know, I feel like that as a non-binary person, too, that, you know, there's just this like restless um, this kind of constant like moving around different places and feeling like you 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 fit in like you have to kind of like contort yourself to fit into places um and so that's kind of where the theme of binding comes from and the obsession with um uh kind of securing things into these like neat oversimplified structures um and so i'm really fascinated with kind of the question of like what happens when um that com becomes unraveled and when you have to kind of face your own existential uncertainty, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Um, Charles, I feel like the the idea of isolation is really interesting in your film, um, whether intentional or unintentional, but the the way that the the family, the main family, the husband, wife, and their child, how they are isolated in a way from the Jewish community. Like they're accepted, but they're not fully accepted because the wife is is uh she is converted and that kind of creates this alienation that she feels and he feels as well but if you want to talk a bit about that sure yeah i mean it, um the isolation is very important in the film because uh like they they you know they're they're what are called come from a ways right they they're not necessarily from the community they live um and the community they live doesn't have a large Jewish community, right? So like to go through this process, it, it, it is like an isolating thing. You kind of feel extra alone having to like kind of put a bris together. Like, I mean, even when you look at the Sandik, right? That the guy brings for the bris, it's just like, it's just like a random guy from, that he knows from work <laughs> that he brings in to basically be like the kid's godfather. Um, so yeah, the feeling of isolation is, was very important, right? Um, throughout the whole thing because they, they kind of are alone. And it is, um, it is a very challenging thing to try and maintain you know, some of these, um, some of the Jewish traditions in communities where it's not um, prominent, you know, I mean, I live in one, like, for example, like getting where I live, getting kosher food, it's not easy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if you were um, living like a very full out Jewish life could be a challenge here. Um, so like trying to get that across was very important. Um, you had mentioned hiding, though, like they, they, uh, they aren't hiding in any way. Though, you know what I mean? It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Some people interpret it, as they're like trying to hide some of the stuff they did, but in, in, in the way, I mean, and hey, like once a movie's made, it's completely open to how people interpret it, right? But I mean, in my mm -hmm. mind, um, they're never hiding anything. The main character, both of them, the husband and wife, don't feel like they've ever done anything wrong, right? It's only when the rabbi comes in and shares his point of view that the thought even enters their mind, right? And to that rabbi, in that rabbi's mind, he is right, right? But in their minds, yeah. they're right too. And I mean, hence that, the gray area right when it comes to religion right now just one religious authority can come in and say no 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 that's not right and then throws your whole life out of control yeah for sure um i think um well mark if you want to go next or um i think i think the thing mark in in your film that's interesting is that there's kind of a dual-sided isolation in a way where 
you know, the the family, the Jewish family, they, you know, there's kind of that lingering, the lingering trauma that kind of creates uh, isolation where they have to, you know, fend for themselves, protect themselves. Um, but there's also the the flip side of that with the with the housekeeper, where there's the kind of imposed upon isolation where she's doesn't really know what's going on and why it's going on, and that makes her feel isolated within the family that she's a part of. Yeah. Um, sorry, my fridge just turned on. So I, I apologize good. if that's coming through. <laughs> I um, cleaned the glass, so I think it's synced up perfectly. Okay, great. Um, like literally as I hit unmute. Um, the, um, yeah, I, yes. Yeah, it's complicated in the film, like deliberately. I, I think the main thing about what trauma does is that it isolates people. And that's what my film, my film is about. It sort of cuts you off into your own, um, you know, you're into your own space. And so you, it's restricting and constricting. It makes you paranoid. It makes you mistrust, um, or it can do. And um, certainly in my film, that's what I, I think is the arc of the film, is that there is connection between a little girl and a housekeeper. They love each other. They play with each other. They're in the same space together. They cuddle, they tickle and they have this great bond. And then by the end of the film, one of the little girl is stuck in a cupboard and can't, and is accusing her of something and she's alone, she is isolated. So, I, and the mother is also uses her like daytime napping to kind of live, you know, to sort of medicate effectively against the world. You know, it's subtly put into the film and, um, but yeah, so it is the enemy of, the enemy of, of, of connection. Trauma. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, the film is, is completely hinges on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Um, Uriah and Asaf, I, you, you could speak individually about your films, but I, I think there's a really interesting thing of setting your films in the desert, in what, uh, which are already kind of places where you can be very isolated. And I think in Uriah in, in Devik, you know, the, the mother and son are kind of in a connected isolation in a way where they're, where it seems where they're the only two people that are really going through their suffering and tribulations and Asaf where, where Ali is going through his personal crises and identity crises and you know, he starts in the resort completely by himself, and he and by the end of the film, spoilers, but he he's by himself as well. So, I don't know if you want to speak a bit about the setting in addition to what the characters actually go through and how like kind of the the setting plays into that. Um, Asaf, if you maybe want to go first, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> uh, um, first, I. I think yeah. I mean, uh, the desert in general is a is a place which holds a lot of symbolic, uh, you know, um, meanings and and Sinai for sure. Uh, but um, very uh, more uh, um, specifically uh, speaking, um, yeah, it's kind of a um, hideaway or getaway place and, and Sinai especially is a place where people are running away, you know, you can say for uh, having some peace and quiet, not only, it's not the only reason why, but uh, it's kind of a place where you, you know, uh, your expectations are to have this kind of, uh, you know, either a retreat or to, uh, you know, kind of, um, 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 yeah, a place where you have uh, the ability and privilege to reflect or to, to rethink or, you know, it's a place that a lot of people are, yeah, uh, that's how they treat this, uh, specifically Ali, in a way, he's, yeah, he's running away from something, from himself, you can say, in a way, or from his own identity. And as the cliches, you know, it's always you, like there's this saying that no matter where you go, you end up finding yourself there. So um, 
the setting uh, plays a very uh, unique and in a way um, fundamental uh, role in, in the story and yeah that regards to, to the setting about what you asked before I think um, yeah it's 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 very Jewish <laughs> uh, in a way, and I think the Israeli take on on feeling it's not feeling isolated, but it's kind of a constant tension between your individual and national identity in a way, or uh, feeling I can speak only for myself. Um, that I think in a way uh, Ali shares this uh, identity. Um, that it expresses a dual uh, or a split viewpoint of someone who feels both inside and outside. I mean, uh, that's how I feel about, you know, something it's a kind of, you can call it a love-hate story uh, in a way about the place and reality I live in. And, and it's kind of a, also, you, you can say it's a very, it's an, an emotional, it's not something intellectual. Yeah, it's like an emotional state of, a sense of belonging and a sense of alienation. So uh, for me, just trying to express this uh, con construct or this human um, you know, condition is good enough in a way. I'm not interested in, in pinpointing any, I don't know, political agenda or anything uh, more than just, just trying to express this emotional um, paradox in a way, or a human condition. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Uria, last, last but not least, <laughs> your question. <There> you <laughs> yeah, so actually from a very early stage of the writing process, I thought about the place that Elia and Nomi will go and instinctively I thought about deserts and desert and then I realized that it should be uh, near the Dead Sea, which is like the lowest uh, spot in the world. And I felt this is the right thing for the journey, like to go like, I don't know, from the center of Israel uh, to the lowest spot to deal with. Uh, I think that when I thought about that, I, I thought about the, the quiet that you can find in such a place. Uh, in the in the desert and specifically in this area of the Dead, Dead Sea and and also the symbolic meanings of that and um, and yeah this is why I chose uh, that spot. Fantastic! All right, thank you all. Um, so we are starting to get some audience questions rolling in here. Um, just a reminder to all of you that are uh, watching tonight's Q and A. There is a Q and A section at the bottom middle of the screen and if you submit your questions I will read them. So we have a question for Anika. Um, keeping in mind um, one of my previous questions was there a specific point you were hoping to make in the relating of the Hasidic and BDSM communities both of which depending on who you ask are considered taboo in much of American and global society. It's a big one. Big question there. I mean, I feel like that question is starting to kind of answer itself a little bit or pointing out something that yeah. is true. Like, uh, I, I wouldn't say it was like my genius plan. Like, I don't think I went in with like a clear thesis, but I do feel like there's an instinctual, like it makes, I, I liked that both of them are communities that I know feel misunderstood by mm. the outside world um, and that have kind of very, um, like, kind of one-sided or single-minded representations of them often. Um, I know a lot of ex Hasidic people who I have met have complained about kind of the constant focus and fascination of the outside world with kind of like the worst parts of the community or the most traumatic and the most tragic parts. And that kind of being all there, there seems to be when there's like a lot more nuance and a lot more kind of lived experiences. Um, and I know in, in the BDSM community, I mean, no one seems to be able to get it right. I'm, and I'm not going to claim to get it right because I don't, I also don't think the relationship in here is by any means like a, a ideal or like a, an example of like a, a really good one. It's just, I, I do, I did try to be, I did want it to be kind of realistic and, and nuanced um, in the kind of ways that people can be like really, um, 
like strangers can be really scary to each other mm -hmm. on the internet, but they're also people and, and they can be really vulnerable to each other too. And those those things feel like contradictory, but they they coexist. Um, and I know that my uh, my actors who um, all have some level of having been involved in either the Hasidic or ultra Orthodox um, or Orthodox community um, and having left um, to uh, or having kind of a foot out the door um, really like that it depicts a, it's a story about people who are living in the community and it's not really something where anything you know anything within the film really changes or happens drastically um, it's just like about people who are like in life and the complexity of that so I did kind of want to do that with it and I think it's true it's really smart to point to both of the ways that those communities are kind of very much like not understood from the outside. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, let's see, we are getting a couple of questions here. Um, Mark Celeber has a question for Charles. Um, I'll, I'll, re, I'll re, re, <laughs> restructure this question so it's, it's a little bit more family friendly. But um, Charles, did you, um, whoop, sorry. Charles, did you ever think about having the husband not pay the rabbi at the end of the film? I didn't want him to myself <laughs> as I was writing it. I was like, I, I hoped he wouldn't. Um, yeah, I totally didn't want him to initially, like just on a personal level. But uh, but I felt for the story, um, it made the most sense for him to, to make the payment because I think had he not paid him, um, I think it would have opened a bigger can of worms for him, right? Because at least in his mind, if you wanted to have some record of it happening, um, to be able to say that he did do it, him making the payment would actually be the way of doing it. I mean, it's, I don't, I, I, I'm not too overt about it in the film, like, especially because we, you know, you don't want to linger on a laptop screen, a, a person making an e-transfer for too long, but he does yeah, yeah. actually even put in the notes um, that's what the payment is for. Right. So at least he has a record of it. So that's why in my mind he did it so that he could at least have a record of uh, of that uh, moil, the rabbi being there to perform yeah. the, the bris. I, I know also when I was uh, when we were watching these uh, films, when I was watching the moil, I was like, you better not pay that man. But, um, <laughs> tough realities. Um, so we have another question here from uh, from Mary says, thank you for such an amazing uh, grouping. I guess they're very much enjoying the conversation so far. Um, all right, so they have questions for everyone, but we'll start with the following. Um, Anika and Mark, you both got to, uh, sorry, you both got amazing gets with your acting talent. Anika for Itzik and Mark for the housekeeper that's from Downton Abbey. How did you get these folks? Um, Anika, if you want to start with that. Oh, you're muted. All right, yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, well, Lily is my roommate. We live in, um, Lily who played Itzik is my roommate. We live in a Yiddish house in the Bronx and I wrote it for her and she is friends with Malki. Um, so that is how the casting happened. It's very fortuitous. Fantastic. Uh, and Mark, there you go. Um, yeah, Sophie, um, who plays the housekeeper in in my film is from is in Downton Abbey. Um, I I don't really watch Downton Abbey, so I wasn't um, kind of chasing Downton Abbey, you know, um, in my in my casting. But I just knew that she was someone who um, I knew of her anyway, and her energy and her presence and her charisma just felt really right for the part. So um, I, I, so I didn't just, I didn't go into casting it with that in mind, but I knew that she obviously had some profile. Um, and I just offered it to her. I mean, we just offered it to her through her agent. I didn't know her personally and she read the script and she, she was really up for doing it. So it was, it was, it's a really un mysterious answer. Well, there you go. <laughs> um, but I guess going off of that, um, Mark, one of the things that that's really striking in your film is the, you know, the relationship between the relationships between everyone um, and the, how it really does feel like a family. Um, so may, if you could just talk a bit about what that casting process was like for the mother, the child, and then with, with Sophie, just 
so if Sophie was kind of offered the the part just right off the bat, was was she brought in during the casting for the other parts to kind of get a sense of trying to create that family dynamic no, or no um no i mean the two the mom as well lydia who is also an amazing i mean i'm a theater director mm -hmm. um before i'm a filmmaker so i've been make, directing plays for a long time and i knew lydia who's got a big tv and film experience too but i knew her from the theater and i just wanted I'm again I just thought sent her the script and through her agent I don't know her that well I just sent her the script and she and I was so blown away by her wanting to do it and I just sensed that she had the kind of subtle like high frequency um underplayed some that she has a lot going on under the surface and I, I just felt that she could bring that to the a character who probably of all the characters has is is has I don't know it's just just there's there's less space for that to be expressed on you know maybe explicitly and and um the the big challenge for us was was the girl I mean the little girl I, I stupidly wrote a film that which, which was built around a six year old girl and her point of view and she has to carry the film really and in my naivety of filmmaking I guess I did that and then had to find the girl and I was very very lucky but that process was. Like I'm sure other people have been through something similar. You, you know, we we had a great casting director. We put out um, our brief to some children's agencies, and um, and she was the that was the one where we had a real process. We we got tape self tapes from like forty girls and little girls. I mean, the girl was five when we auditioned her, and um, and we did uh, first round group auditions uh, with groups of five six girls together doing bits from the play bits from the film and and improvising and then we had a final four girls come to the final round and the, the 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 girl we cast was the youngest the least experienced the biggest risk because she's a wonderful ball of boundless eccentric glorious energy and i just we just didn't know if it'd be contained on set um and we didn't know if she would understand even the shooting process but she turned out to be prodigiously um unexpectedly uh alive to everything and so smart and so intelligent so yeah um building the dynamics between them just came because i think as much as anything that girl was able to be isabella was able to be so present and open and listen she just listens so well on screen and so much of her performance comes from what she's not saying um and that I think release the, the 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 natural skill and experience of the other two actors. Wow, yeah. I mean, it's we it's wild to kind of hear you say that was a risk casting her because she's she's so naturally gifted and that performance is really incredible. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. We have one from James who uh, has a question for all of you. So we'll again we'll go around. Here, um, do any of you, uh, do any of the filmmakers have plans to lengthen out their shorts into full length films? So um, let's let's start with uh, Yuria. We haven't started with you yet tonight, so we're we're throwing you here. <laughs> uh, actually, yes, it, yeah, I'm I'm just working on uh, I'm working on some big projects, and one of them uh, I just started working on it. It's not exactly like it's a developing of the relationship between uh, the son and the mother, but it deals with other issues that I'm dealing with. Uh, like um, I'm ex-religious and this, it's hard to say what it's exactly about because it's an, in a very early stage, but it's it based on this connection between the mother and the son and kind of like um, also growing up film, but it, it follows they both like in many years from an early stage to yeah this is what i'm working on very cool looking forward to it i guess i'll i'll extend that uh sentiment to all of you if you are working on f uh, feature versions i'm very excited to see what you come up with um asaf would you like to answer that question next um <clears throat> actually uh we were thinking about uh, 
it, it's very it's interesting because this um, idea in a way came very much from from the actor Ala Daka, who feels uh, and I think rightly so that we haven't really in a way we just touched uh, some uh, angles or you know um, issues about Ali and we are both very much uh, intrigued about the character. So he was uh, more than once uh, telling me, come on, let's, uh, let's continue, let's make it into a feature film. And I actually have a very practical idea of how to uh, make it happen, but in a way, I prefer not to. Uh, first, uh, from very practical reasons, I'm now actually in the middle of, of, of a feature project, which is very demanding, and um, I cannot, uh, um, uh, you know, I don't have uh, literally the time in the near future to do that. But um, a more a better excuse, in a way, or reason, because this is a true reason, is that. I, I prefer sometimes to uh, leave some space and not to, uh, in, in that specific case of, of a story, um, I, I'm more intrigued about uh, letting go and leaving this character uh, in a kind of a vague future or a vague, uh, um, I don't know, um, like, is uh, the story of where he comes from and where he's heading to. Um, I, I, I think it, it, uh, in a way it's a more, it's a bigger challenge for me to kind of hold back and not to uh, kind of clear out uh, those areas in a way. And yeah, so we were really practically uh, considering that, and I actually came up with an idea of, of how to make it into a feature film, but I decided not to. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, th I think that ambiguity at the ending is very, it's very satisfying, um, just knowing that there's so much more. I don't think it's a frustrating kind of any. I feel like sometimes people want closure and answers but i i very much do like the ambiguity of the ending but i do i'm like but i do want to know more so i can just tell well. you practically <laughs> practically the idea is to have three uh, like a trilogy in a way that to have mm. a first episode in berlin where you see where he comes from and i have a third episode a prologue a prologue and an epilogue a third episode in the in the wedding so it's actually constructing three short films into one um but yeah I can, um, you know, give out this uh, because I probably won't make it. So okay. <laughs> um, Anika, do you want to answer that question? Yeah, um, we are developing uh, the binding of Itzik like, as a feature, um, just because it feels like there's a lot more to explore with Itzik's journey through gender and sexuality, or kind of the the unbinding of Itzik, I guess. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're developing that. I, I'm really excited about that. Fantastic, excited as well. Um, I look forward to seeing that um, down the road. Um, Mark and then Charles. Uh, yeah, um, I am thinking, I'm sort of doodling around with it in my head, yeah. Um, there's a definitely, there's either a, a completely distinct story also drawn from family, sort of semi-drawn from family experience that, uh, plays with the same subject matter, the same thematic stuff, or there's a, a a longer version of my of the short, which folk is a bit more focused to the mother um, mm. uh, and pushes her story into a much more uh, uncomfortable place. Mm. Interesting. And Charles. Yeah, I actually hit save on the first draft yesterday. <laughs> the end of it. Fantastic. The first draft yesterday. Um, but it's it's not a, a direct adaptation. It's more, um, it's, you know, a film that features like the same themes, right? So there, there's actually no bris in it at all. But it, it's more about a couple meeting and the one's a Jew, one's not a Jew. And it's more about the conversion process and uh, but told in a, in a pretty interesting and unique way. I'm actually very excited about it, uh, you know, because the film, the short, The Moyle, deals with a lot of themes that, you know, I think don't just apply to Judaism. I think, like, just apply to religion in general that I, you know, 
a lot of themes that I think are really worth exploring, right? You know, especially living with, trying to live with religion in the modern world, you know, can pose challenges for everybody. And so I think there's a lot more there that are worth exploring and talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I feel like I can speak on behalf of the Boston Jewish film audience. Um, we really look forward to all of your projects in the future, um, hopefully near future maybe. But um, I think that's gonna just about do it for us here um, for tonight. Um, so Charles, Mark, Anika, Uria, and Asaf, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, I do just wanna say before we head out tonight, um, the films that were selected for this year's Fresh Flicks um, competition, it is weird to think of it as a competition, I'm like, oh, we're all so friendly here. But, um, um, but the films that were selected were uh, selected by a jury. So I just wanna do a quick shout out to Caleb Almani, Bradley Babender, Goldie Etter, Naomi Fireman, Sarah Gardner, Olivia Grant, and Summer Jeet Wobble. Oh, and Lonnie Weil, last but not least. But thank you all. Um, thank you to our jury for selecting the films. Thank you um, all for joining us um, for just a fantastic conversation. Um, make sure you watch all of the Fresh Flicks films um, and vote for your favorites. They're all my favorites, personally. So I can't vote. But um, I hope you uh, all enjoy the conversation tonight and um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the festival and see you at some more live events. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night.